Hello and welcome. I'm Don Renfrew and for the next hour or so I'm going to be speaking about imaging of musculoskeletal symptoms. I'm a private practice radiologist with Radiology Associates of the Fox Valley, which is a 30 plus person radiology group covering nine hospitals in the state of Wisconsin. I was formerly on staff at the University of Iowa and at Rush Presbyterian St. Luke's Hospital uh, as a musculoskeletal radiologist and I will be speaking today about general problems uh, and how to image them in the musculoskeletal system. There's another lecture that I will give which includes specific problems of different joints within the musculoskeletal system, shoulder, elbow, wrist, you get the picture. But for this conference, what I'm going to do is talk about generalized musculoskeletal problems. This talk is for primary care practitioners. What I'm trying to do here is to address the information needs of those primary care providers that need to know what study to order for what set of symptoms. And so in general terms, if there's some general musculoskeletal issue, this lecture is designed to um, help you as a primary care provider figure out which study to order under what circumstances. There are a lot of primary care providers in the United States. Many of them are family medicine providers, but there are also nurse practitioners and physicians assistants, internal medicine physicians, emergency rooms uh, frequently are, uh, have several patients in them at any given time whose problems are not really acute, but simply uh, uh, end up in the emergency room for any of various reasons. Uh, so emergency room physicians also often need to know what imaging study to order for a given non-emergent uh, patient symptom. And this, uh, this talk is directed uh, at, at helping all those people who are in a position to order imaging studies to be able to order the right one. Um, as I mentioned before, I was at one point an academic radiologist and have written papers on musculoskeletal uh, radiology. Um, at this point in time, for several years, I've worked at a small rural community hospital, which is a critical access facility in Door County, Wisconsin. Door County is a uh, resort community of about nine to 10,000 people. Uh, Door County, the um, geographic structure is between Green Bay, the geographic structure and north of the city of Green Bay. And it's, uh, it's to the west of Lake Michigan. It's where that red star is in this map. Um, the hospital is 50 miles from the nearest other hospital, and uh, there are a number of primary care providers in the hospital. In addition to my duties as a radiologist in this hospital, I also direct uh, grand rounds. And in directing grand rounds, uh, it became apparent to me that many of the primary care providers would benefit by some help and direction on exactly what imaging study to order. And at the same time, a lot of academic programs, uh, for various reasons, um, are not necessarily strong at providing the kind of information for primary care providers about what the first imaging study to order is. And so that's, that's what this talk is all about. Of course, as a primary care provider, uh, you have a lot of options for imaging the musculoskeletal symptom, uh, symptoms. And they include plain films of the musculoskeletal system, um, MR, CT examinations, uh, bone mineral density studies, nuclear medicine studies, um, other studies that aren't even shown here. There's a lot of different ways to image the musculoskeletal uh, system. At the same time, you really want to order the right study the first time every time. You don't want to order two or three studies, uh, two of which are unnecessary. Uh, you don't want to expose the patient to unnecessary radiation. It's certainly a cost burden to order an unnecessary exam. So, so it's very important to order the right study the first time every time. And that's what this talk is all about, to try to get you to order the right study the first time every time. Um, so to help you do that, again, I'm going to review general musculoskeletal symptoms. Now, in all my lectures, I try to follow the precepts of Cliff Atkinson's book, Beyond Bullet Points. And he, uh, this book is based on several research-based principles, and some of those principles include the fact that, um, for the most part, as a speaker, you're lucky if uh, somebody will remember three or four points you make over an hour-long talk, six to eight months later. Um, as a consequence of which, he recommends trying to structure your whole conference, your whole lecture around 
emphasizing and re-emphasizing those three points that you've identified uh, that you want the audience to learn. So it, it, with that in mind, I'm going to try to go through uh, very carefully on these red slides exactly what I want you to remember six months or eight months from now. The rest of the stuff should support that, and you may find the rest of the lecture scintillating, fascinating, interesting, um, keep you on the edge of your seat. I hope all that's true, but the main thing I, I want to keep in mind is that uh, for you, six to eight months from now, if you can remember the stuff on the red slides, the three or four things I say on the red slides, I think we're doing, we're doing well. All right. So we're going to review generalized conditions, as I said before. I do have another lecture about the particular conditions of more specific joints. Now, what are the three points of, of this talk? The three points of this talk include point number one, um, even though uh, the evaluation of poly, uh, even though the, this is a talk on imaging, um, and even though Radiographs are, excuse me, uh, in arthritis can be really dramatic and very characteristic. Imaging plays a minor and supportive role in the initial diagnosis of polyarthropathy. Uh, now, the reason, part of the reason for this is that the disease, uh, while late in the disease processes, uh, rheumatoid arthritis and psoriasis and ankylosing spondylitis and so forth have really dramatic uh, characteristic features early on there may not be much in the way of radiographic features, and uh, those features may, may not be particularly uh, specific. Point number two, it, most of your extremity masses uh, are benign, and they're not really uh, clinically significant. So imaging should be performed um, basically when they're malignancy suspected or when the cause is really unclear for these uh, peripheral lumps and bumps in the musculoskeletal system. Finally, I do want to talk about bone mineral density, particularly the fact that women over the age of 65 should have a DEXA study to evaluate bone mineral density. So those are the three key points I want you to try to keep in mind and try to remember, you know, a month, two months, six months from now. And we'll go through each of those in turn and try to teach some other points about musculoskeletal imaging um, of the entire system. Okay. Um, Now, as I mentioned before, even though late the disease process, any one of a number of arthropathies like rheumatoid arthritis, ankylosing spondylitis, can have very obvious, characteristic, severe, dramatic features. Early on, those features may be subtle or even absent. Um, since I'm a radiologist, however, I'm going to start out sort of at the end stage of all these processes and show you what you'll probably see in most radiology textbooks as classic examples of different disease processes. So we can talk about the imaging finding of these a little bit, but remember, what I'm showing you here is, is by and large almost always something that is known and diagnosed at the time the imaging was performed, and the imaging was more performed to assess extent of disease, severity of disease, progression of disease by comparison with prior studies, uh, rather than the very first time the patient came in with complaints. So uh, let's just look at a few Typical cases. Here's a 70 year old woman uh, with chronic hand pain. This is a ball catcher's view of the hands, and it shows multiple classic features of rheumatoid arthritis, including extensive multi level metacarpophalangeal joint subluxation dislocation, lots of erosions, demineralizations, and carpal collapse. So, on this blow up view, you can see that uh, you know, patients with rheumatoid arthritis at the end of their disease frequently have this. Uh, ulnar drift or, or metacarpophalangeal joint, characters metacarpophalangeal joint subluxation where their phalanges drift laterally over, the, over their metacarpals. Um, and in this case, uh, as seen here at the arrow, the small finger metacarpophalangeal joint is frankly dislocated. Um, the blue arrows here show you the multiple subluxations, severe subluxations of the metacarpophalangeal joints along with joint narrowing at multiple locations. The other thing that you can see of course is that rheumatoid arthritis is a synovitis. The inflammatory changes of the synovium will attack the bone that the synovium is adjacent to. At the, uh, at the ends of the bone where there's articular cartilage, it's got a 
kind of chewed through the articulate cartilage before it gets to the bone. So the erosions typically occur in the so-called bare areas, and these are areas within, inside the, within the joint, but not covered by articular cartilage. So around on the corners of the metacarpal heads, uh, and, or uh, yeah, metacarpal heads is seen here at the yellow arrows, that's where your erosions are going to be most severe. And anywhere where there's not articular cartilage covering bone, where synovium can be in direct contact with the bony surface, and not just the cartilage surface, uh, you can see erosions in rheumatoid arthritis. In other synovial processes too, of course, but right now this, we're talking about rheumatoid arthritis. Here's a close-up of the carpus of this patient. Uh, you see that there's multi-level joint narrowing, uh, as seen here at the white arrows on slide 26, where there's been loss of joint space between the navicular and the uh, radius. It's actually kind of hard to identify this, uh, and, and distinguish the different carpal bones because there's been so much carpal collapse and collapse of joint space and erosive change. Um, you can also see my proximal migration of the capitate because of separation between the lunate and the scaphoid and proximal migration of the scap uh, capitate through time as seen here with the yellow arrow. And then here's kind of the overall overview. So this patient has long-standing rheumatoid arthritis. And usually, again, imaging is done to evaluate disease progression, uh, often after treatment. And there's various medications to treat rheumatoid arthritis at this point. Um, imaging obtained late in the disease, again, shows multiple classic features like extensive multi-level metacarpophalangeal joint subluxation and dislocation, all those extensive erosions, demineralization, and carpal collapse. Here's a 49-year-old woman with pain following trauma who did not have any fracture and also did not have any really uh, joint symptoms per se. This is going to be an example of the same process much earlier on. Now, the post-traumatic films here were done before the onset of her uh, rheumatoid arthritis. The margins are, the bony margins are well defined and the joint spaces are preserved as seen here where these yellow air or the white arrows are. Um, a couple of years later, she has on recent onset of morning stiffness and polyarthropathy. And as you notice here, we're going to have joint narrowing, as seen here where the white arrows are, where before we didn't have any joint narrowing. And we also have joint erosions where the yellow arrows are, where before we didn't have any bone erosions. So on the left or in the A panel, you see uh, pre-rheumatologic symptoms, a foot film done for trauma, preserved joint space, no cortical erosions, after the onset of symptoms, loss of joint space, cortical erosions along the metatarsal heads. Now, how about non-plain film methods of looking at rheumatoid arthritis? I'm going to go through in a little bit um, some of the criteria that rheumatologic, rheumatologists use or, or other people use for diagnosing uh, rheumatoid arthritis. But this is sort of an evolving field, and there was a recent article in, in Radiographics that basically talked about the ability to um, pick up imaging findings with magnetic resonance imaging prior to plain films. Now, this is not standard everyday widespread clinical practice, but to let you know, this is an evolving thing, and, and it may be that rheumatologists will more and more use MR as part of the decision criteria to decide whether someone has an early inflammatory arthritis. Now, the abstract of this article says, quote, early diagnosis and treatment have been recognized as essential for improving clinical outcomes in patients with early rheumatoid arthritis. However, diagnosis is somewhat difficult in the early stages of the disease because the diagnostic criteria were developed from data obtained in patients with established rheumatoid arthritis and therefore aren't readily applicable. Magnetic resonance imaging is increasingly being used in the assessment of rheumatoid arthritis due to its capacity to help identify key pathologic features of the disease at its presentation. So, uh, the, the abstract also goes on to say, MR has demonstrated greater sensitivity for detection of synovitis and erosions than either clinical exam or conventional radiography, and it can help establish an early diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis. MR also allows the detection of bone marrow edema, which is thought to be a precursor for the development of erosions in early rheumatoid arthritis, as well as a marker of active inflammation. In addition, MR imaging can help differentiate rheumatoid arthritis 
from some clinical subsets of peripheral spondyloarthropathies by allowing identification of inflammation at the insertions of ligaments and tendons or endocytes. In other words, you have a patient with early rheumatoid arthritis and polyarthropathy, and you're trying to figure out whether they do have rheumatoid arthritis versus some other spondyloarthropathy. MR can help make that distinction. All right, we'll get back to that in a little bit. In the meantime, I want to show you some other sort of classic arthropathies. Here's a 42-year-old man with chronic back pain. This is a long-standing process. This patient already had a diagnosis, but I'm showing you these just to kind of pique your interest. Note the poor definition of the sacroiliac joints at the margins in this exam. And here on the lateral exam of the lumbar spine, you see multiple characteristic features. These are better seen at a higher magnification here on slide. 49. And this examination shows what are called marginal syndesmophytes, where there's ossification along the peripheral margin of the intervertebral disc, as seen here at the white arrows. There's also increased density from reactive new bone formation along the vertebral body margins. These are called either shiny corners or romanus lesions. And you can see these here at the yellow arrows. The net effect is that the spine resembles a piece of bamboo, and the usual term for this can, uh, radiographic image is a bamboo spine. Of course, this is a disease process uh, known as ankylosing spondylitis, which is an endosopathy which causes inflammation and eventual calcification or ossification of the ligaments with associated lack of motion. And remember the antheses, E-N-T-H-E-S-E-S, -E -E antheses are those anatomic structures where uh, uh, ligaments and tendons insert into bones. And so, pathology of that location is enthesopathy. They're kind of a family of diseases that can cause enthesopathy. There's also just degenerative uh, ossification, calcification of the antheses, um, which is often minimally symptomatic, but is a finding that you'll see on plain films. So that's ankylosing spondylitis. Here's a um, a 75-year-old man with chronic knee pain, uh, and on the frontal view, you can see chondrocalcinosis. Here's a blow-up view of the same image, and just help you out a little bit more, there's some arrows. This is cartilage calcification, or chondrocalcinosis, and this has occurred, in this case, in the fibrocartilage of the meniscus. Typically, fibrocartilage becomes calcified prior to articular cartilage. There are different histologic types of cartilage in joints. Articular cartilage is usually what covers the ends of the long bones and allows the synovial articulation. Fibrocartilage is more like the spacer, labrum in the shoulder, meniscus in the knee, uh, that kind of thing. So the lateral exam on this particular case also shows calcification in the suprapatellar bursa, and as you see here at the arrow, uh, a little bit magnified view. So there's abnormal calcification not only in the cartilage, but also in the synovium in this patient. And in the blue arrow in the back here is actually the more typical arteriosclerotic calcification of the elderly. Um, the yellow, just to be uh, thorough, is our vascular clips from uh, vein harvesting for this patient who underwent, uh, I believe it was a cabbage that they needed a, a vein for, so they took it out of his leg. Um, so here's kind of the overview with the arrows at the locations of chondrocalcinosis of the fibrocartilage of the menisci in the knee, and then some synovial calcification in the suprapatellar bursa. Um, this is a composite picture of this patient at CPPD or uh, uh, calcium pyrophosphate dehydrate crystal deposition disease. Typically, this is diagnosed based on a combination of chondrocalcinosis and aspirated of, uh, and, and aspirated joint fluid. Here's a 62-year-old man with some index finger pain. Uh, he's had chronic index finger pain, and he's got a very swollen finger at this point when he comes in. You can see it here at the arrow. Uh, the lateral study shows also significant soft tissue swelling, quite a bit of soft tissue swelling. Again, seen better here at the arrow on slide 77. And um, you can actually see these findings somewhat better at a higher magnification. Um, there's a lot of soft tissue swelling of the index finger. I mean, you can appreciate this guy's huge swollen and painful finger. Um, and there are also classic cystic changes uh, with the so-called overhanging edges, which is typical of this process, which is, of course, gout. As is frequently the case of patients with gout and radiographic manifestations, the patient had gout for several years, 
before he developed much of the way of radiographic findings. Uh, this picture with Rose shows you those cysts with the so-called overhanging edges. I think there's one, another blow up here. Yes, on slide 84, we've got some arrows as, as showing that edge that actually goes beyond the usual cortical, expected cortical margin of the phalanx. There's kind of stick out beyond the margin of the phalanx. And, and that, those are the classic overhanging edges of the gout. Um, so here's your composite picture again, uh, AP and lateral view of overhanging edges. There's a lot of soft tissue swelling. Uh, a lot of severe disease, so that man had gout. Here's a 58-year-old woman with chronic knee pain. Um, this pain for her was uh, worse with use and better at rest. Um, here's a blow-up of her AP joint of her knee. This was a standing view which can accentuate this joint narrowing seen here between the two white arrows along the medial compartment. People will talk about the medial compartment of the knee, the lateral compartment, or the patellofemoral compartment, or patellofemoral articulation, sort of a tricompartmental joint. Those compartments are, you know, separated by any synovial septi. They're, they're, they all are sort of interconnected, but that's just terminology used about the knee joint. At any rate, in addition, to the joint space narrowing here, the yellow arrows show osteophytic spurring along the joint margins. And um, here's a uh, notch view again showing medial joint space narrowing, as well as some subchondral sclerosis. Uh, and again, the yellow arrows on slide 97 here show the osteophytic spurring and medial joint space narrowing. Um, the red arrow here shows some sharpening of the tibial spines or tibial eminences. Um, this sharpening is also typical of this patient's disease process, which is, of course, osteoarthritis. So she's got most of the findings of osteoarthritis, joint narrowing, subchondral sclerosis, osteophytic spurring. Doesn't have a lot of subchondral cyst formation. That's the, usually the fourth uh, classic feature of osteoarthritis. Uh, here's an axillary view of her. Uh, knee, also called a sunrise view, it shows you the patellofemoral articulation. The longer facet uh, located to our right is the lateral facet, and the shorter facet is the medial facet, and there's the patellar apex between those two. Uh, the white arrows here on slide one and three show you a lot of um, osteophytic spurring along the joint margins. And here on a lateral study, we see uh, osteophytic spurring along the superior margin of the patella and the inferior margin of the patella, seen here with the white arrows. And finally, we have our composite picture of joint narrowing, subchondral sclerosis, osteophytic spurring in a patient with osteoarthritis. Now, those are sort of end-stage processes or end-stage end figures in people with different types of arthritis. And th there are, in addition to those arthropathies, I've talked about a number of other arthropathies, including psoriatic arthritis, uh, other crystal arthropathies, in addition to gout um, and CBBD. Um, and there are other inflammatory arthropathies, too, such as those associated with systemic lupus. And I'm not going to go into great detail about any of those. The same points apply to them. Uh, they're in their classic end stages, they can be pretty characteristic, but by that time the diagnosis has long been made. In their early stages, they may simply prevent, present with swelling or pain in the joint, and there may not be much in the way of radiographic findings, or they do have radiographic findings that may not, not be specific. Now what I want to talk about is a must-not-miss diagnosis in someone who comes in with polyarthropathy. You know, sometimes septic arthritis is, is a monoarthropathy, but sometimes it is a polyarthropathy. So, um, some of the patients may have a classic and characteristic clinical history, like a sexually active young woman with skin lesions and gonococcal arthritis, or maybe a Wisconsin patient from our neck of the woods, literally, with a history of a tick bite and who has Lyme disease. Or sometimes a patient who's had a total joint replacement, which now hurts after a skin infection, uh, who's seeded the prosthesis from hematologic spread of organism. Um, most of the patients with septic arthritis and polyarthropathy will usually have some finding of systemic illness, like a fever or weight loss, or lab values with an elevated white count, or a high sed rate or a high C-reactive protein. 
Uh, diagnosis usually relies on aspirating joint fluid and demonstrating greater than 10,000 uh, white blood cells per uh, milliliter, or, or, uh, and, and that those uh, cells are 75% polys. Since the joint aspiration can show turbid and worrisome fluid but not yield a positive culture, uh, if you see pus coming out of there, you really think it's got to be infected, but sometimes it doesn't grow germs for various reasons, one of which may be that the patient's already on antibiotics. At any rate, blood cultures done at the same time can be helpful in some cases. Uh, plain foam findings usually lag well behind the clinical features of septic arthritis, and they usually show a nonspecific joint effusion. Dramatic features like destruction of cartilage and erosion of adjacent bone usually occur pretty late in the process. Um, here's a 68-year-old diabetic with a draining ulcer along the base of the small toe metatarsal. Uh, this AP course uh, shows uh, uh, with some early in the course of symptoms demonstrated an intact metatarsal head uh, that's shown here at this arrow. Um, now, six weeks later, we've got destruction of the metatarsal head and the proximal aspect of the uh, proximal phalanx, as you see here at this arrow. And if you compare the two exams side by side, you can kind of better appreciate that that metatarsal head is being eroded away from an inflammatory process. Uh, a foot exam, foot MR exam was also done. MR is often helpful in these cases to diagnose osteomyelitis when there are equivocal plain film findings or in the setting of extensive cellulitis uh, and expected bone infection. Um, and also, they're helpful to evaluate for draining abscess. It can show changes well beyond the extent that you see on the plain films. Um, now, in this case, I note the altered signal along the lateral forefoot, shown here at the white arrows. Um, the subcutaneous fat on our image on the left should be white, and then the image on the right should be black. And you can see a lot of kind of gray tissue surrounding the small toe metatarsal. These are cross sectional images of the forefoot. Uh, and you can see abnormal marrow signal as well. Um, the sagittal T1 weighted image uh, was so abnormal uh, here on Psalm 131, it's kind of hard to identify the normal anatomy. Uh, but this picture shows you a blue arrow at the small toe metatarsal shaft and white arrows showing you the region of the joint with actually the distal aspect of the metatarsal at the more inferiorly located, the lower white arrow on the slide. And then that other white arrow is actually at the base of the proximal phalanx of the small toe. So there's been dislocation or severe subluxation of this infected toe. So the guy's got um, infectious arthritis as well as osteomyelitis as well as cellulitis. Um, here, uh, you have a T1-weighted image in the arrow at the, where the, uh, I'm sorry, it's a T2-weighted image in the arrow shows you all that abnormal bright signal in the fifth metatarsal shaft. Um, here's a composite picture then of the dislocated small toe proximal phalanx and markedly abnormal signal along the distal metatarsal. So the patient again had diabetes, diabetic foot infection, septic arthritis, osteomyelitis, septic infection of the soft tissue. Um, so if you have a patient who has polyarthropathy and the patient's not infected, then a lot of different, com a lot of different uh, diagnostic considerations come into play. And the ultimate diagnosis is going to result on a constellation of findings. No one clinical feature or laboratory or imaging test is going to be definitive. The usual first step is to figure out whether the disease is inflammatory or not. And that's usually established by the presence of morning stiffness, especially prolonged morning stiffness, and redness, warmth, and swelling of the joints. So they've got those features, that's an inflammatory process. Uh, it, what if it's not an inflammatory polyarthropathy? Well, it's almost always osteoarthritis. Non-inflammatory polyarthropathy is almost always osteoarthritis, in which case the diagnosis is often straightforward. The clinical features include a lack of morning stiffness, aggravation with motion, and an improvement with rest. These are characteristic features. Plain film findings can document joint narrowing and osteophytic spurring, subchondral sclerosis, and subchondral cyst formation, like we saw in our example above. Especially by the time these patients come in, they usually have had these features for a while. 
uh, had the disease for a while and they have associated radiographic features. Okay, so that leaves you, what about inflammatory polyarthropathy? Well, there's uh, crystal arthropathy and they can cause an inflammation, but they're more often a monoarthropathy and I'm going to talk about those in a single joint section of the, of the talk rather than a polyarthropathy. Inflammatory polyarthropathies are much more likely to represent infections or post-infectious processes or rheumatoid arthritis, systemic lupus erythematosus, or psoriatic arthritis. So, in patients with inflammatory arthropathy, blood tests can be helpful. You've got rheumatoid factor and antibodies to uh, citrullinated peptides. Those may be positive in patients with rheumatoid arthritis, whereas the antinuclear antibody is sensitive but not specific for SLE. Uh, it is important to note that experts caution against indiscriminate use of laboratory testing since, for example, about 25% of patients with rheumatoid arthritis may be seronegative, and many patients without rheumatoid arthritis will have positive serorheumatoid factor. Now, as I kind of pointed to earlier when I was talking about the MR and the plain film findings of rheumatoid arthritis, there are actually multiple criteria that rheumatologists use to diagnose rheumatoid arthritis. The American College of Rheumatology has provided diagnostic criteria for the diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis. And it includes the presence of any four of the following seven features, and they're generally present for at least six weeks. Um, these include morning stiffness lasting one hour before maximal improvement, soft tissue swelling, of three or more joint areas, arthritis of the hand joints, symmetric arthritis, rheumatoid nodules, serum rheumatoid factor, and typical radiographic changes of the hand or wrist. As I noted before, the radiographic findings play a minor and supportive role, and they only represent one out of the seven features. They're not an absolute requirement for the diagnosis since the patient may have any combination of the four of the seven features for the diagnosis. Um, recall as well, though, the MR may show you features that plain films do not, and it may supplant or support a diagnosis in times to come as these uh, criteria evolve. Um, again, this is our picture from earlier where you've got joint narrowing and erosions in a patient with relatively early rheumatoid arthritis. Um, psoriatic arthritis, all right, to confuse matters, at least radiographically, probably clinically as well. Patients with psoriatic arthritis may present in any of at least three different fashions, and one of these bears a strong clinical and radiographic resemblance to rheumatoid arthritis. The other two are dactylitis, swelling of a single digit, and a, uh, with a sausage digit, so-called sausage digit, and spinal arthritis. Now, while the characteristic skin changes and nail pitting of psoriasis proceed or occur at about the same time as the arthropathy in 85% of the cases, that still leaves you 50% of the cases where the skin manifestations may occur after the onset of arthropathy. And anybody with polyarthropathy, where it's not absolutely obvious that they have rheumatoid arthritis, and they may have psoriasis, you want to look for hidden spots for psoriatic lesions, like in the scalp and in the uh, cleft of the buttocks and so forth. And, and, and you can make a real coup diagnosis of psoriatic arthritis if you find psoriasis in those sort of hidden spots that's, that's early on in its manifestations. So that, that's, the, um, that's the scoop on polyarthropathy, radiographic manifestations, early diagnosis, and, uh, and late manifestations. And so, so I'll leave that for now, and remember the key point there was that even though radiographs are obviously used often and, and for all kinds of different arthropathies, early on in polyarthropathy, they frequently don't add very much. Okay. Uh, how about extremity masses? Well, the point to make here is that most of your extremity masses are benign and not clinically significant. Ganglia and nodules represent most of these soft tissue masses. They're of little clinical consequence and they generally don't require imaging. Uh, what are ganglia? Well, ganglia are uh, collections of cystic or gelatinous material in or near a joint or a tendon. They usually represent an outpouching or the felt to represent an outpouching of a joint synovium, so it's kind of ballooned out or a tendon sheath, and then it's thick, and the fluid in there gets thickened and solidified, solidified, especially if they lose the communication with the parent joint um, or parent structure. Um, ganglia will often transilluminate, uh, and surgeons will usually resect such lesions on the basis of their clinical exam without any imaging. Even prior to resection, office methods 
include attempted aspiration or injection of steroid into the ganglia. And these uh, relatively straightforward and, and not that drastic of measures uh, can result in uh, treatment in over 80% of the patients, at least in some series. Um, soft tissue nodules, is, other than ganglia, can arise in a variety of conditions like repetitive trauma, places where silicon's been injected, uh, rheumatoid disease, sarcoidosis, and vasculitis. Nodules are also present, uh, may also represent epidermoid inclusion cysts and galliotophus, which we saw a case of before. Uh, multiple lesions tend to be infectious or inflammatory. Solitary lesions usually represent some sort of non-inflammatory nodule or tumor. Uh, in cases where imaging is contemplated, and it's usually not necessary unless the diagnosis is uncertain or malignancy is suspected, uh, your three main imaging modalities uh, to consider are plain films, ultrasound, and MR. How is that going to help you? What are those going to show you? Well, plain film evaluation first, uh, and it's usually where you start out. The plain film evaluation of bony tumors has traditionally been the method of choice uh, because it basically allows histologic characterization of, in a lot of tumors, like an osteosarcoma or benign exostosis. It shows you exactly what you need to know and may even prevent surgery or direct surgery. Uh, in palpable lesions arising in soft tissues, Plain films can be useful to provide additional information by either showing calcification of the lesion or characteristic changes in the adjacent bone or joint, which allows you to make a diagnosis. Uh, plain films can also show features of a lipoma or a cluster of flea bliss, uh, characteristic of a mangioma, depending on the exam technique factors and exactly how you catch the lesion on your plain films. Um, acute inflammatory processes may be associated with periostitis of the adjacent bone and chronic indolent masses can produce smooth remodeling of the adjacent bone. These are usually features of a slow-growing or benign lesion. Um, a lot of times the plain films obtained from palpable soft tissue mass don't sell anything. Um, so there's a 64-year-old with uh, lumps along the great toe metatarsophalangeal joints. This is the right foot, and again you see a big old soft tissue lump there along the metatarsophalangeal joint. Here's bilateral view A and B with uh, arrow on the soft tissue lump and calcification of that lump in A. And then in B you can see a, an erosion in the great toe metatarsal head next to it. Um, here's a magnified view of the left side and that shows you some bone destruction where the arrow is on the right side here on slide 169. So, um, in this case, plain films have shown you calcification of the lump, and in this typical patient of gout, it's also shown you associated bone changes, which are typical of gout. Um, so the plain film has helped in this case, although it wasn't really obtained for the lump, but it was, there was a lump there, so I included it here in the talk. Okay, um, what about ultrasound? Uh, well, ultrasound's helpful, most helpful, where you're trying to differentiate a cystic lesion from a solid one. And ultrasound's really good at that task. It's almost 100% accurate. It can also be helpful in distinguishing lesions with internal flow on a, by the use of color Doppler imaging. Those are like tumors, for example, that show internal flow, uh, as opposed to those lesions without internal flow, like blood clots. Um, and you can also see wiggle worms of increased flow with uh, vascular malformations. Um, unfortunately, distinguishing one histologic type of tumor, solid tumor, from another is usually not possible with ultrasound. And evaluation of the adjacent bones and joints uh, for secondary uh, helpful diagnostic features is not really as easy as it is with a plain film exam. So ultrasound has a role limited typically if, if you think it's a cyst or if you want to see if it's got blood flow in it or not. Uh, how about MR? Well, MR was really supplanted CT in the evaluation of soft tissue masses in the last 10 to 20 years. It may allow a uh, histologic diagnosis in the cases of a lipoma, and it allows near certainty in a lot of other lesions like cysts and ADMs. It doesn't always allow histologic characterization, and usually it's, for a lot of your just general soft tissue masses, um, it can't really tell you whether the lesion is benign or malignant. But Using available tables in the literature and breaking down the tumor type by its location versus the age of the patient and comparing the frequently seen lesions, it's usually possible to provide a brief differential diagnosis which contains the correct diagnosis. Um, 
In addition, probably more importantly, it allows the determination of anatomic features like whether the tumor is confined to a compartment of origin or, and or whether it displaces or invades critical adjacent structures like a neurovascular bundle. And these factors figure into the orthopedic oncologist's determination of the optimal approach or even whether the tumor can be resected. Uh, as an example, here's a 78-year-old with a palpable thigh mass along the anterior thigh. Um, here I've got arrows marking the lesion. These are sagittal exams. You can see the hip joint kind of at the top of this exam. Um, and this was uh, an example of a benign lipoma. It was completely, uh, the lesion, the palpable lesion was formed completely and entirely of uh, fat. So these lesions, you can basically, unless they're mechanically obscuring or cosmetically deforming in some way, you can usually just leave them alone. If they grow, you know, you can take them out, but basically uh, not that important. Now, another really important point to note about soft tissue masses is you want to consult. You want to consult someone before you biopsy the mass. And you usually want to consult if you think there's any chance of it being malignant, an orthopedic oncologist or an orthopedic surgeon because um, you want to biopsy them only after the consultation. Surgery for malignancy, if the lesion ends up being malignant, it usually involves resection of any tissues which may have come in contact with and been seeded by the neoplastic tissue. So in the event that the biopsy is malignant, which you won't know until after the biopsy is done, the orthopedic oncologist will need to resect the tract leading from the skin to the biopsy location. And therefore, the surgeon will want to optimize the biopsy path to optimize the result of that resection. Um, now, just as another example, here's a 50-year-old woman with a palpable wrist mass on an axial T28 MR. Uh, the marker here shows you where the palpable lump was on this particular sequence. It's not all that easy to see the marker, but there's, there is where the marker the, uh, uh, the white arrow is. Now, this lesion is in the midst of a bunch of the flexor tendons along the palmar aspect of the wrist, and the blue arrows show you those tendons which have been displaced in a sort of centripetal fashion around the lesion. The yellow arrow on this slide shows you the lesion itself. Um, on the T1-weighted image, the lesion was kind of gray here at the yellow arrow, and you could again see the displaced tendons of the blue arrows, the white arrow again shows you the percutaneously placed marker, and it's a lot easier to see on the T1-weighted image. Um, here's a coronal image, same deal, yellow marker or yellow arrow shows you the lesion separating out those tendons which are now aligned in the plane of the image, and so you see them as longitudinal uh, structures. Um, you appreciate them as longitudinal structures. Uh, of course, there, uh, here, here's a, you know, a composite of all four of those images, but uh, of course there's going to be dozens of other images included in the scan. Uh, at the time of surgery, a giant cell tumor of the tendon sheath was resected, uh, and the patient did well after surgery. So that's the, uh, the upshot on the uh, uh, imaging features of various palpable lumps and bumps in the extremity. Again, most of those, the ganglia, the nodules, you don't really need to image those in most cases. If there's a suspicion of malignancy, your options is to do plain film, ultrasound, MR, um, and which of those to start with. You may want to ask your radiologist if you think it's a lipoma but may be deep or may have some complexity to it, perhaps an MR would be the best choice. Um, if it's obviously and definitely a bony tumor or feels real firm, probably want to start out with plain films just to see what's cooking there. And sometimes if you get the MR first, you may have to backpack them with the plain films to kind of further elucidate things that are seen on the MR. So um, that's the story on lumps and bumps in the soft tissue. Uh, leads us to the third and final topic we're going to talk about today, which is that uh, uh, that women over the age of 65 should have bone mineral density uh, studies, uh, dual energy x-ray absorptiometry to evaluate their bone mineral density. Now, osteoporosis is largely a silent disease and it usually doesn't have symptoms prior to what may be a devastating hip fracture. 
Indeed, fragility fractures of the spine are often asymptomatic and they can be discovered when imaging the skeletal system for some other purpose. Um, I'll give you a couple of examples here. This is a pre-nursing home admission chest x-ray. Uh, this woman was otherwise well other than going into a nursing home. Um, here we have an exam from a few years previously uh, where she had uh, you know, some pneumonia or a little chest pain or whatever. Um, and uh, on it, uh, it's a little hard to make out the thoracic spine on these two, but let's look at them side by side, crop blown up and see what we can see. The arrow shows you new wedging of a mid-thoracic vertebra on the image on the right labeled B versus the one on the left. Um, the, there's a, therefore, a fragility fracture of the thoracic spine that developed in the interval. The patient did not have any diagnosis made at the time of that fracture. Um, our next case is a different case in an elderly man. He went CT for abdominal pain. Here, the sagittal reconstructions on that CT show several deformed vertebral bodies. So I'll mark a couple of them with the arrow here. Uh, and, and, you know, those are not normal configurations for vertebral bodies. Uh, because of these fractures, which were asymptomatic, uh, or at least not worked up at the time of symptoms, if the man even came in for the evaluation of those symptoms, uh, he underwent bone mineral density measurements. And here you can see some uh, information. Uh, these are, this is like our typical printout for the bone mineral density studies. Uh, I'm going to blow this up a little bit and uh, put a box around the important uh, salient feature, which is a T score of minus 2.1, so he's demineralized compared to a young, healthy adult male in the hip. Here's uh, his uh, lumbar spine measurements, and the blue arrow or the blue box here shows you that he's even more demineralized and actually meets the cutoff for osteoporosis of minus 2.5 for a T score in the um, uh, lumbar spine. And uh, he obviously, you know, was having fractures, here shown in this composite image, uh, he was having fractures of his spine on the basis of uh, osteoporosis. So what about osteoporosis? So even though it's often silent like it was in these two cases, osteoporosis is an important disease to diagnose. Uh, it's widespread in the U.S. There's uh, at least one and a half million fractures, including a quarter million hip fractures, uh, and that's only going to increase as baby boomers age. Um, it's going to be a source of significant morbidity and mortality. About half of hip fracture patients won't be able to walk without assistance. Uh, a quarter of them are going to require long-term assistance. Um, there's a 10 to 20 percent mortality rate six months after a hip fracture. It's a source of tremendous medical expense. Um, in 1995, which is eons ago, it was 10 billion a year at least. Um, and finally, there is effective treatment with both non-pharmacological and pharmacological therapy resulting in a decreased risk of fracture. Uh, fortunately, there is an excellent tool for reproducible and cost-effective measurement of bone mineral density um, with a minimum of radiation exposure. It's called dual energy x-ray absorptiometry, or DEXA. Uh, there are other methods of measurement of bone mineral density, like quantitative ultrasound and quantitative CT, but DEX is preferred. Basically, it's the World Health Organization reference data that was obtained with DEXA, and then uh, DEXA measurements are incorporated into the WHO diagnosis and treatment guidelines. Um, in addition, uh, prospective cohort studies have demonstrated a strong relationship between fracture risk and bone mineral density measured by DEXA. And randomized trials have shown a reduction in the fracture risk with the drug therapy based on DEXA results. Uh, now, to determine which patient may benefit from a DEXA study, it's necessary to assess multiple factors like age, sex, menopausal status, body mass index, cigarette smoking, family history of osteoporotic fracture, and the first degree relatives, and use of oral corticosteroids. Women with elevated risk factors should be screened by at least age 60, and probably all women by 65, even if they don't have any risk factors. Screening in men is less well established. But it is important to note that men account for about 20 to 30 percent of all hip fractures, and they have a, an associated high mortality rate. Screening should probably be considered for men over the age of 75 and for those with a history of oral corticosteroids, alcohol abuse, or hypogonadism. So, um, who, do you, uh, who do you study and where do you study? Uh, regarding what part of the body to study, the patient's overall risk of a fracture could be estimated by measurement of any location. 
But fracture is for a particular location, spine or hip or forearm, is best estimated by measurement of that location, which makes sense. So your hip measurement best predicts it, the likelihood of a hip fracture, which is more likely to be disabling than a forearm or back fracture. However, spine measurements are more sensitive not only to bone mineral density, but to bone mineral density loss and gain following treatment. So usually you're going to measure the hip and the spine when you're evaluating for osteoporosis. Um, now, the report for a DEXA study usually includes uh, the bone mineral density, the ROS, you know, the grams per square you know, the, the actual measurement of bone mineral density. And then they also include uh, typically a Z-score, that's the number of standard deviations if the patient's bone mineral density is from an age match cohort. And a T-score, which is the number of standard deviations that the patient's bone mineral density is from peak bone mineral density. And then one way you can think of all elderly women are abnormal in the sense that the bone mineral density is going to be low enough to put them at risk for fracture. So a Z-score of minus one with respect to their cohort is going to be an awful score because they're all at risk for fracture. They're even more at risk for fracture if they have a low Z-score. T-score tells you how bad their bone is compared to its peak bone mineral density, and that's really the one thing that you want to concentrate on more, uh, or at least initially. Um, some reports, uh, like the reports I generate, will include a FRAX score. That's the 10-year likelihood of a fracture based on the risk assessment tool developed by the WHO in uh, 2008. Now, further evaluation and treatment, you've got to kind of individualize to the patient, but triggers for treatment uh, usually include a T-score of minus 2, or if you're using FRAX, a 10-year hip fracture risk of 3%, or a 10-year overall fracture risk of 20%. And note that using FRAX instead of the T-score as a basis of treatment will usually result in treating more older patients with higher or better T-scores rather than younger patients with lower or worse T-scores because age is an independent predictor of fracture. So T-scores and fracture, uh, FRAX don't necessarily end up with you treating the same patients in the same, in the same manner. Um, what about follow-up on treatment? Um, up to a sixth of uh, patients taking bisphosphonates may continue to lose bone following institutional therapy. So usually you follow those patients at a two-year interval. And follow-up studies, uh, usually you want to perform those on the same machine or the same brand of machine at least. It's really hard to evaluate changes across platforms um, unless you've done cross calibration and it's rarely the case. So in patients with a significant bone mineral density decrease following treatment, Further evaluation could include evaluation of the therapy adherence, um, looking at whether the gastrointestinal absorption uh, of the medication has been adequate, uh, whether they get adequate, whether the patients are getting adequate vitamin D and calcium, and then you may want to work up for the development of any other disease that may adversely affect bone mineral density. Um, just as an aside here, or maybe not so much an aside, you may see uh, both in the lay literature and published medical journals the fact that for some of these bisphosphonates, patients have been showing up with uh, stress fractures of the femoral shaft or even completed fractures of the femoral shaft after development of a stress fracture. Um, this is kind of a side effect of the way that uh, the bisphosphonates seem to save bone. Um, and so if you, if you see that, you know, this, this is something that you probably will hear more about as time goes on. And whether you know, these drugs become modified or a different kind of drug is used in the future, will probably depend on uh, further evaluations of populations of patients on bisphosphonates and whether the fracture rate of these femur fractures is higher. Note, however, as I, as I uh, talked about before, randomized control studies have shown improvement of overall fracture rates on the drugs versus not. So even though some people have this peculiar response of forming a movie, uh, unusually fragile bone or bone likely to insufficient fracture, um, most of the time, the increased bone mineral density is, is associated with a protective effect against fractures. All right, so that leads me to my summary slide and my points again uh, in this talk where the evaluation of polyarthropathy relies on such factors as history, physical exam findings, and laboratory evaluations, and radiographs serve a minor supporting role. Radiographs at the end stage of arthropathies are highly characteristic, often and very dramatic, but that's not going to be the case when the patient first comes to you with their initial complaints of arthropathy uh, or polyarthropathy. MR may have some role down the road in sorting out early inflammatory arthropathies, 
uh, and documenting uh, earlier in the inflammatory arthropathy so that the rheumatologists can kind of jump in with the uh, heavy duty drugs that people are now being treated with for rheumatoid arthritis. But for right now, that's not a, a community wide or, or a, a, you know, nation wide uh, uh, recognized use of, of, the, of the modality. Um, the second point is that most extremity masses are benign. They're usually not clinically significant, and imaging should be performed uh, when a malignancy is suspected or the cause is unclear on clinical examination. And again, you can use plain films if it's a bony, hard, lumpus kind of thing, and you're probably going to have to get plain films somewhere in the course of the workup anyway, so you should start with those if it's a bony or firm or, or, or hard tumor. Um, otherwise, if you think it might be a cyst and you just want to say cyst versus solid, ultrasound's a good study. Um, MR is probably the workhorse in evaluation of peripheral musculoskeletal mass lesions. It's going to show you, uh, in some cases, the tumor type, lipoma, pretty strong indication in the ABM and, and uh, uh, so forth. And probably more importantly, it shows you the size, location, uh, relationship to adjacent structures, whether it's a in, invaded uh, um, neurovascular bundle, whether it's extended out of a, of a compartment which makes resection more challenging. Um, so MR is going to kind of give a roadmap to the surgeon about what's going on in a tumor that's going to come out anyway. Uh, and then finally the last point is that at least women over age 65, 60 with risk factors, men maybe 70, 75, uh, should probably all undergo DEXA to evaluate their bone mineral density because you don't want them to present with a fracture we want them to present, uh, or you want them to come up on a screening study and then treat them accordingly uh, to try to prevent that fracture and to take the measurements you can to prevent fracture. Although I didn't mention it much in here, you know, of course, uh, before you get to the point where you're taking drugs for bone mineral density, um, exercise aerobic or probably more importantly anaerobic weight load type exercises and uh, adequate doses of vitamin D and, and uh, calcium are, uh, are important measures to undertake in reducing the number of fractures that uh, are sustained by the elderly. Thank you for your time and I hope you enjoyed this talk uh, and see you again next time.